A tree of life and a river of life. Praise the Lord. It's in the beginning of the Bible in Genesis, and it's in the end of the Bible in the end of Revelation. And this is God's plan. Jesus came to give us life and life abundantly. This is Revelation 22, session 45, and we're getting ready to wrap up the book of Revelation. The New Jerusalem comes down upon Mount Zion, and it is the eternal holy of holies. It is also the eternal garden of Eden. Life is being restored to the planet as God had intended from the very beginning. We think of heaven as being someplace separated from earth, and right now the heavens are above the earth, but the plan was that heaven and earth would be united in one. The kingdoms of this world would be the kingdoms of our God. The presence of God is in the Holy of Holies. He's enthroned in the Holy of Holies. The light of his glory, the Shekinah glory, illuminated the Holy of Holies. And that's what the New Jerusalem is going to be like. This structure that's shaped like the Holy of Holies, filled with the presence and glory of God, the illumination of the Lamb himself, the light that created the universe is going to be beaming, pulsating with life inside this, this new city, the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem, the eternal Eden, where we see the tree of life again, where we see the river of life flowing through the midst of the city. And these both point to Jesus. He is life. And the greatest thing is that in this city is the presence of the Lord. In his presence, Psalm 1611 said, is fullness of joy. And in his right hand are pleasures forevermore. So this is all to get us to focus towards those things that are eternal. Look back in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. It says the Lord planted a garden. He put on his little overalls and his <laughs> gloves and he got out and he planted a garden in the east of Eden. And there he put the man whom he had created and that he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. It's interesting. East of Eden, there was a garden and the river flowed out to water the garden. This is the same river. This is the river that we see flowing from the temple that's flowing out into the land of Israel, bringing life. The Dead Sea is going to come to life and all these fish are going to be there. Everywhere the river goes, there's life. God created us to live in a garden in an intimate place with him. And that is so sweet when you think about it, that the creator of the universe created this garden, an intimate place to fellowship with us. That's what he's restor restoring. The, everything in that garden was created for us to enjoy, except for the knowledge of good and evil. The there was a tree that when you ate of it, you obtained the knowledge of good and evil. Up to that point, man only knew good. We only knew the goodness of God. And so when we partook of that that tree as, as mankind, we became suddenly thrust into a world that had judgment, and that had death and sickness and disease. It was something, the knowledge of good and evil somehow created this, this rip in, in our relationship with God and release all these other things into the earth. So today, I really pray that we will eat from the tree of life, that we will learn to feast on the tree of life, which is Jesus himself, and that we'll resist feeding from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is all about us, satisfying our desires of our hearts and our minds and the things of this world. Uh, believers are actually commanded in, in 1 John 5, uh, 2, 1 John 2, 15-17, and it says, do not love the things of this world or the things, let's read it in the NLT. I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation because it says it real plain. Sometimes people don't understand what it means, flesh, and, and, and things, those words. But do not love this world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, 
you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the love of the world only offers a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. So the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and feeding on that is, is feeding on those things that satisfy our inner desires. The, the tree of life is all about feeding on Jesus, the creator. <laughs> He's the eternal one. And eternal life is not just living forever because those cast into the lake of fire are going to live forever in torment. But they don't have this type of life, this eternal life. They don't have this abundant life. They're we're not talking about the quantity of years. We're talking about the quality of life within us. The life of God desires to be in us. And desiring to feed on the tree of life is desiring Jesus, the creator of life, and not being so short-sighted that we attach our hearts and our minds to the things that he created. We look above those and see the creator and attach our hearts and minds to him. But by nature... You know, we, we crave the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It satisfies our mental curiosity and our cravings of our, our heart and our mind. Many people are really just content to study about God, to learn biblical principles, to learn things in this world that will make them a better uh, husband and a better wife or a better father or mother or a better leader or to live, you know, our best life now instead of realizing that we sacrifice our lives to follow Christ and obtain the ultimate best life that we could ever imagine as we partake of the tree of life. So there's uh, no mention of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven, our, our eternal home. But there is a tree of life and there is the river of life. The tree of good, the knowledge of good and evil will be gone. So Jesus spoke about this river in John seven thirty seven. 37. Uh, he said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly, out of his heart, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the spirit. So the, li the river of life is all about the spirit of God flowing from the throne. In Ezekiel, we see it flowing from the throne. Ezekiel 47 gives us this picture, and it starts out as a trickle from the throne of God. And as it flows out and further and further, it gets deeper and deeper. And this shows us that as we walk and follow the river, that we get deeper and deeper until finally it'll carry us. And this is the goal, to be carried, caught up in the Spirit, to live uh, filled with the Spirit of God. This is true life. This is life in abundance, that we're propelled by it. What does it look like to be carried by the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit, to be filled with the Spirit? Some people have totally different ideas of what this means, but it's interesting because people who are charismatic, and I was... I, most of my time I've spent in charismatic churches because I've seen the power of God at work. And it is sometimes, um, you know, abused and sometimes people take care things to extremes and, and sometimes people get emotional. But I have experienced the power of God overwhelm me in a way that, you know, you just can't explain the way that you think or act or respond under it. You know, at Pentecost, the people watching thought that the people who were receiving the Spirit were drunk because they were so giddy and just full of this bubbling joy inside of them. But one of the best definitions of being filled with the Spirit, to me, comes from a man, David Jeremiah, who I, I don't I never heard of him speaking in tongues, and, and in his early years, he actually used to preach against the gifts, kind of like cessationists who say that the healing has stopped and the gifts have stopped, and and that's because they haven't experienced that. But you know, David Jeremiah almost died from cancer. Uh, some women prayed for him; he was healed <laughs> supernaturally. Some Pentecostal women <laughs> were praying for him, and and his tone has changed because you know we can't live without the supernatural power of God, and however it manifests in our life, it's really important. It may not look the same for everybody. So we've never seen, I've never seen him speak in tongues or hear about him talking about that anymore. He doesn't talk against it anymore, but this is how he described being filled with the Spirit. 
He said when he was young, there was this old uh, grumpy man. Did you ever have like an old grouch in your neighborhood? And his trees, you know, his house was all kind of overgrown and looked kind of rickety, you know. And, and he and David and his friends decide they're going to toilet paper this guy's house. And he has this fence around it and this gate, you know. And uh, as they're toilet paper in the house, the guy comes outside with a shotgun yelling at him. And David was filled <laughs> with fear and that fear empowered him to run and leap over a gate in a fence that he could no way do in his natural strength or energy. So that spirit empowered him to do something that he could not do on his own. This is what it's like to be filled with the spirit of God. The life and the power of God fill us and empower us to do the things that we could not do on our own. Number one is to be a witness. Wait, you know, uh, Acts 1.8, in Jerusalem, until you're filled with power and you will be my witnesses, you know, where you live in the outlying areas to the ends of the world. This is a work of the Spirit of God. It's not something we can do by ourselves. When we preach or when we teach or when we share with people, it's not so much the words we say, but the power of the Holy Spirit that makes it alive to people and gives them the revelation of the truth. And that is what this book is called, The Revelation of Jesus Christ. <laughs> revelation 22, verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits. Each tree, somehow this tree is on both sides of the river that's flowing from the throne of God down the main street of the city of God. And this tree is producing fruit. And every month it produces fruit, twelve fruits. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. So there was no harvest season. This tree just produced fruit all year round. I think it's an example of God's great abundance and provision for us and how he takes care of us. The trees were for the healing of the nations. And that kind of, uh, that's interesting to me because we're now having a picture of the eternal city, uh, the final conquest of of evil, Satan has been thrown into the lake of fire and uh, this city has come down upon the earth and we're living in it and there's he trees for healing. I, I don't think in a resurrected body we're going to be sick or need healing. This does represent a source drawing our life and strength from God, but you know what's a mystery to me is that if it speaks of healing, maybe there's somebody who needs to be healed. Maybe there's somebody who got saved during the millennium or people during the millennial time who haven't been resurrected from the dead. Jesus said, then when we're resurrected, we're neither going to marry or be married. We're going to be like the angels in heaven. But what if these people that got saved still aren't resurrected and then there's still people outside? Because Revelation 21, 27 says, you know, the new Jerusalem, no unclean thing or anyone who does anything detestable and no one who tells lies will enter the new Jerusalem. And here in, in Revelation 22, 15, it says outside of the city are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. So Revelation tells us who can get in the city and who won't get in the city and who are outside the walls. I just... I can't help but wonder if there isn't some type of redemption, work of redemption that continues throughout eternity. You know, we're saying that we're going to be serving him, with him. We're going to be on thrones, ruling. And so there's very possibly in this new heaven and new earth creation and people who are still going to be redeemed. And once they're resurrected and their new bodies transformed into their new bodies, then they'll live in this city. But we may still have a work of redemption that goes on throughout eternity. Okay, there's something else that I was thinking about. The tree of life was in the Garden of Eden with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they were cast out of the garden. And there was a separation, a barrier formed. In Genesis 3.24, it says, After he, the Lord, drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim 
and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. That represents the blazing word of God. It creates a separation between truth and error, between the spirit and the flesh. But I think this blazing sword guarding the tree of life represents uh, the fact that we can't go back and partake of the tree of life with our selfish, sinful, rebellious nature, or we will die. So there has to be a death involved in order to access the tree of life again. So I think Jesus actually died in our place because that death sentence was upon us and hovering over us. He died in our place to open the way for us to partake of the tree of life again and the river of life by breaking the curse of sin and death that was on us. So now we follow his example if we want to walk with him into life and follow him back to the tree of life. This is how we do it. We die to (laughs) ourselves. We choose to die to those things that continue to come up. So he broke the power of sin. He broke the curse that was over us. He took the consequences of our sin. Now we choose to give our life for him. He died so that, 2 Corinthians 5, 15, those who live would no longer live for ourselves, but for the one who died for us and lived for us. The tree of life and the river of his spirit is He's holding him out for us, beckoning us to turn from those old things in our life and turn toward him. In Matthew 16, 24, if anyone would come after me, this is the words of Jesus, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And we'll, he'll lead us right to the tree of life. Galatians 2, 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I give my life back to him and he fills it with his life. And then that life is the life that leads us into eternal life. So Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it's written, cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree. So the curse involved immediately after Adam and Eve both ate, the Lord came and he said, what have you done? And, and of course, Adam's like, well, the woman you gave me, you know, and then the woman's like, oh, the serpent. And the Lord's like, You guys are going to be separated from me, separated from this place. You're going to have strife, struggle between the man and the woman. There's going to be a struggle there. And the ground is going to be cursed because of this. And you're going to struggle and strain to, by the sweat of your brow to produce a livelihood from this earth. But what God is doing through uh, the redemptive work of Jesus and by letting him die on the cross, he's breaking that curse off us. And he's allowing us to now proceed with the original plan. Heaven is now going to be joined back into earth. That separation that was caused by that sin and rebellion where where the heavenly things were pulled away from the earth. And now we are allowed to live in the consequences of our choices and sin. Now this heaven is being restored to the earth and they're being united as one. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord. So back to Revelation 22. Verse 3, it says, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. So there's going to be some kind of service here, and it may have something to do with those who are outside. The service of God continues, and his servants, the doulos, the bond servants, are the ones who this is promised to. Revelation 22, 4 says that we'll see his face. The servants, the bond servants will see his face and his name shall be on our foreheads. His name represents his authority, his provision, his character, the power that manifests through his spirit. It's going to be manifested in the way we live. We're going to demonstrate and reflect who he is because we're living there in his presence. Revelation 22, 5, and there shall be no night. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord gives them light and they shall reign forever and ever. He is going to be the eternal glorious light beaming from this city. Uh, Genesis 1-3 says, And God said, Let there be light. 
and there was light. And that was before, you know, Genesis 1:14 where he created the sun and the moon. So light, the essence of light is in him and re re represents his presence and it is not dependent on a sun to create it or a moon to reflect it. Light is going to emanate from the Lamb. Then, uh, Revelation 22, 6, he said to me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the spirits of the prophets, that's the holy prophets in some Bible, sent his angel to show his servants, his doulos, the things which must shortly take place. In Revelation 1, 1, remember, he said the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, his doulos, his bond servants, what must soon or suddenly or quickly take place. And here in the last chapter, we're told that this book was written to show his bond servants, his doulos, the bond servants, what will suddenly take place. So you see, it wasn't written to everyone. That's why it's so hard to understand. It's written to those who have given their lives to Christ, devoted their lives and become bond servants. So doulos, this word in the New Testament that means a bond servant, is someone who belongs to another. And we know that the example in the Old Testament was a slave who served a period of time and now was going to be set free, but chose now to serve his master because he loved him. And he'd be taken to the doorpost and they drove a all through his ear, pierced his ear. It represents an open ear to the master. And he willingly served for the rest of his life because he loved him. And this is the root of the relationship with Christ that we are called to be in, this love relationship of serving Christ because of our love. And in the New Testament, it's held in a very high place of honor. And that's who this book is written to. And that's the hope that he's holding out before us is this hope of eternal life. These things will soon come to pass. That's what the verse said. These things were written 2,000 years ago. You know what that word soon means? That when these things start coming down, when these things start to roll, it's going to happen quickly. And that's why we can see the signs of these things right on the horizon. This stuff is getting ready to unfold right before our eyes. And that's why it is so important for us and this generation to take heed to the words of, of Revelation so we will be ready. He encourages us to be ready. There are things to, that we need to do to prepare. One thing is, you know, to get rid of that junk in our life, the junk in our truck that's separating us from God and his purposes. But the second thing is to make sure our hearts and devotions are placed in Christ. And he's going to pull us through. Revelation 22, 7. He says, behold, I'm coming quickly. That means suddenly, suddenly he's going to appear. And he's he said, blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. So we're going to pause right here for today uh, until next week at 6 o'clock on Friday. And think about what does it mean to keep the words of this prophecy? We were talking about keeping his word uh, last week meant to just not only to guard them and to cherish them, but to keep them intact and to uh, act upon them, to, to, to believe them in such a way that it alters our life. But I just pray that we'll understand that this, this book is written to those who willingly serve Christ. And it is preparing us for what is coming right over the horizon. It is coming upon us. And he's holding out this beautiful vision of eternity, of the tree of life, of the river of life flowing from the throne and being in his presence. It is a marvelous city that's radiating with the pulsating, vibrant life and light of Christ. And through all these gems and these prisms of color, and it's going to be so magnificent that he wants us to have a vision of what we're going to. So we'll hold on to those things that are eternal and be able to release these things things on this world that won't have any of value in 50 or 100 years. This world is passing away in the things of this world. So I'm encouraging you to uh, devote your life to Christ. Follow Christ. He's the truth. He's the life. He's the way. He is the light of this world that's going to lead us into this place of eternity. Okay, well, I love you guys. I pray that we'll be able to feed now from the tree of life and, and be filled with the Spirit of God, that it would empower us to do those things that we could never do on our own, to make an impact for eternity right now. I've just been listening to a couple of sermons by Billy Graham. They're so simple, and uh, the message is so simple, yet 
thousands responded to the message because the Spirit of God was pulling them. They were covered and saturated with prayer. He was crying out for God to do what he couldn't do, and the Spirit of God did it. So all things are possible for those who believe. I I challenge you to believe God for big things during this season. Uh, Expand your horizons. Ask him, what do you want me to do, God? Because we're closing in on the end, the time is short, and we want to make our time count for eternity. I speak blessings over you. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. May the fellowship of the Holy Spirit uh, be ours. And, And I pray that we'll be able to walk in peace as we roll our cares over onto the Lord. And and let the peace that passes understanding guard our hearts and minds, regardless of our situation. Our redemption is coming soon. Look up and rejoice. Love you guys. Have a great day. Bye.